Well, we're down here in the workshop right now and uh, going to do a quick video explaining some of the features of the Blitzer tuning system. So here's kind of the workshop, soldering iron and so forth, magnifier and everything. So put it all together down here and um, I've got it over underneath my, my networking panel here. I've got my telephone switch and um, servers and modem and so forth because it just provides a little easy spot to plug in the system and do the testing. So we've got the uh, Blitzer tuning system set up here. You can see the antenna assembly which is the L bracket off to the right. There are some wires attached to the amplifier which is the uh, smaller gray box in the middle. And finally, we have uh, that amplifier box connected to the controller unit, which now has the uh, display. This is Anne Marie's unit. So uh, that came, the kit came missing some diodes that were necessary to get the uh, display working. So those came in from eBay today. I ordered those locally rather than through Germany. So we installed those. Display is not lit right now, but it is working just fine. So. Everything is ready to put the covers on and ready for final assembly and ready for shipping. So I thought I would just kind of come through and point out some of the features on the individual units. So we'll get to that. Here's a uh, fairly close shot of the controller board. I want to point out the, the main sections here. Uh, the unit is running right now uh, so we can um, see some of the lights flashing right now. Uh, we've got a couple of cables connecting into the unit. First of all, we have two connectors on the top, one for the first amplifier, one for the second. In the case of the basic station, we're just using the uh, magnetic field or uh, H-field amplifier, so we're only plugged into amp 1. And if you have just an H-field antenna, uh, an amplifier, it is recommended plugging that into the amp 1. That is pretty much the convention, and the servers in Germany are going to expect to see it set up that way. Uh, to the right of the two amplifier connectors, we see the small square module, which is the actual GPS receiver. There is an antenna built into the top of this. However, for most installations, I found it does not work very well, although if you have a clear view in the sky or on an upper floor, it will, t it will lock in and detect some stations, but the interference from the circuit board seems to reduce the sensitivity of that. So in this case we have an external GPS antenna attached to this uh, SMA RF connector here. And um, here is the here is the small patch antenna which has a magnetic base on the back for attachment to a uh, iron base, but it's not really necessary to use. I'm in the basement now and uh, you can see by the fact that the green LED is not blinking, this is locked in. So the receiver is quite sensitive and it works really, really well with this preamplified, inexpensive uh, GPS antenna. Uh, again, even though I'm in the basement, it's locked in. Um, now looking to the left of the two amplifier connectors, we see there is a, a, a micro, I'm sorry, excuse me, a mini USB uh, connector here that is used strictly for power. And so you can see there's a cell phone charger type power supply. Uh, the one I'm using uh, is a half amp right now, which is a little bit light, I think, for powering up this whole system. I think a one amp supply is recommended, but I haven't seen any operational problems using this, and the supply looks quite clean. So I, I don't see any problem using it as long as there's no additional amplifiers added onto it. Um, although that's something to that's a, a good candidate for an upgrade in the near future. Uh, looking farther down on the board, the top green board is the prefabricated STM uh, microcontroller board that has the analog to digital converters on it that convert the signals coming in this um, networking style cable from the amplifiers onto the ADC connectors on board. It also provides all the smarts and other processor um, related functions for the board. The controller board that needed assembly is the red board that's underneath of it that has all the display support components, uh, signal conditioning uh, circuits, it's the carrier for the GPS and so forth. And uh, it's basically just a carrier that this board plugs into on the top. 
Below that we have the monochrome LCD graphics display that shows various operating parameters uh, of the controller. We've got a, um, a networking connector here that uh, handles the interface to the uh, Ethernet um, router that this is plugged into right now. And we finally here we have a ground terminal connector. It is very important that the system be grounded um, to at least the center screw of the uh, power outlet that this thing is plugged into. An ideal ground would be a, a cold water pipe ground that has a good connection to earth or some other um, suitable ground arrangement. Now one thing to look out for is that uh, right now there's a shielded ground cable that's being used to connect this networking connection back to the router. If you've got a connector on the router that has a shielded type of socket on it that the other end of this cable plugs into, uh, you may have a ground path going through the shield to your router. And if you also have a ground connected here, it's possible to develop what's called a ground loop. That's what happens when you've got a piece of equipment grounded to two different uh, grounds with different potentials at the same time. That can cause some very subtle um, noise problems, some not so subtle. So be sure you either don't use a shielded uh, Ethernet cable back to your router or uh, ensure that your router does not have a grounded socket, metallic socket on it where the other end of this cable plugs into. Or if it does, you might want to try just using that as your system ground and leaving off the external ground here. I've got this grounded to a copper pipe that's running right overhead. There's a, a spade lug connected to the other side of that. And uh, that's how the unit will ship. Uh, going down a little further, you can see we've got a couple of other nice features on this installation. On the side of the box, um, I've installed a couple of, um, a couple of um, additional push-button switches. One marked Display, the other marked Reset. And these mirror the functions of the two switches, the blue and the black switch, that are on the green board. The black switch will perform a reset on the board. You can see when I press it, it reinitializes the, um, the processor. Uh, the blitzer tuning display comes up and then the status display and all the other information comes on. I have this, by the way, set to time out after 30 seconds because I found that leaving the display running continually can introduce a slight amount of noise into the antennas if they're anywhere nearby. So having that time out after um, 30 seconds after last pressing the button is a good way to avoid any of those issues. So uh, the two buttons here control it. The blue button, the black button resets the board. The blue button allows you to scroll through the various screens and functions on the, um, on the controller. Uh, but however, with the transparent cover screwed onto the top, there's no real easy access to that. So again, I've got those Parallel down the side, I've got the reset button, um, and I've got also the um, display button that can be pressed to access and light up the display and wake it up from, from sleep mode. So that's kind of a convenient feature. Uh, the connections from the two push button switches plug into the top of the board here and access the same connect connections on the board that these buttons um, are connected to. These leads over here connect to the AS3935 lightning detector module that's mounted as an option. The firmware does support this module. Uh, it's basically a local lightning detector on a chip. It makes no use of the amplifiers or other antennas or that are part of the time of arrival blitzer tuning system. This is strictly a lightning presence or strike um, bore that detects local lightning and it's got its own little built-in antenna here that is used to pick it up. It's generally fairly short range within about 30-40 kilometers of local lightning and the sensitivity varies depending on your grounding and so forth but I found that it works fairly well and there's some kind of cool things you can do. I have the controller set up to beep, a distinctive beep whenever lightning is detected by that module and that is connected uh, using an I2C microcontroller bus that plugs into the I2C connections on the, uh, on the board here with these jumper wires. Those are pretty tight on there, but if they come off, um, 
you have to be very careful to get those connected to the right points, but they're, they're quite secure, and with the cover on, I don't think there's any danger of, of losing those. Uh, the GPS module has a green LED on it here, and when the board is uh, first turned on or reset, i uh, reset it here, you'll see that that light begins to blink, and that in, uh, actually it did not lose lock. Let's power it, cycle it, and that'll force it to reacquire. So power off, power on, and you can see that that light is, um, kill the power here, or the light here a little. You can see that this light is blinking. That indicates that it is not in a lock state and it's acquiring the satellites. As soon as it is achieved lock, this light will turn off. And uh, if you press and go to the GPS status screen here, it'll show. You can see it's not receiving valid GPS data at the moment. But uh, this light will go off and the blue light on the controller board will blink once per second, which indicates that the GPS is providing a timing reference to provide a very accurate timestamp on, um, on the system, on the detected lightning strikes. So that's uh, kind of basically how it works. Let's uh, take a little closer look at that, at that display. So here's a somewhat closer look at the uh, display on the detector. I'll reset it. So it says Blitzer Tune. Uh, gives you the firmware revision and the firmware date and the PC um, board revision numbers and so forth. When you come up along the very top of the display, you can see it has the different categories of information that will be displayed. Uh, and the button can be used to scroll through those. The firmware now is set up to auto-scroll through these displays or automatically go to the display that um, is, uh, has uh, the newest or most important information to show. It will do that automatically. Uh, and then again, as I said, after 30 seconds this will time out to diminish the noise on the, uh, on the entire system. So uh, normally the display actually is not really used, but if you're up by the display and want a quick status of what's going on, it's kind of handy. So I'm going to get the cursor over to the very first part. Under the system, you've got your CPU voltages, uh, CPU temperature, uh, processor load, uh, the voltage of your power supply that's attached, and the total number of run times since the last reset is shown here. Uh, scrolling to the uh, next screen under the system gives you the firmware version, the date of the firmware, the build date, and the printed circuit board revision number of the controller. And uh, skipping now over to GPS, we can see that's highlighted in black because it has not achieved uh, a valid GPS position. Now it does have lock, but it uh, needs a, some time to smooth and average the position to come up with a very accurate location. For reporting back to the server. And so it's in the process of actually acquiring those. Once the <coughs> excuse me, once the GPS has acquired the satellites, it'll show the number of satellites tracked and the quality of the signal. So we'll come back to that in just a bit. Uh, moving on, uh, we can see we have one pulse per second failure for 109 seconds. That's because we're not again not seeing lock at the current time. Um, in fact, we're going to do a reset out here just to see if we can force that to acquire. All right, so let's uh, we'll come back to the GPS. Uh, next category, uh, you see the cursor over is the network. I have this set up to uh, be configured to a static IP address, which I will change to DHCP so it'll grab an IP address from your router. But it shows the IP address, the subnet mask and the uh, gateway address all retrieved or either manually set or retrieved from the router. Uh, another quick press will show the number of requests received by the server, the total number of data that's been sent, and the last time a connection request has been initiated to send data back to the uh, Blitzer tuning servers. Uh, hit it again, it shows the state current station ID that the station is registered to. It shows the user ID, Admarie's in this case, and it shows we are in manual mode, meaning that um, we are setting the gains locally and not allowing the controller or the, the servers in Germany to manage the gain settings. Uh, that is kind of an experimental feature, and manual mode is the mode that is recommended to be running. Pressing it again, we skip over to the AMP category. 
This shows our current gains on the two amplifiers and the two antennas. So the first two stages are currently running at a gain of 10 on the first stage, a gain of 10 on the second, and the threshold on the analog to digital converter for lightning detection after the signal has been amplified is 122 uh, millivolts, uh, which is the standard um, the standard uh, threshold. And the same settings are in effect for the second antenna. So those, oops, hit the reset. Let's get back to um, back to signal or amp rather. So um, the first set of gain figures are the north-south facing antennas and, and the second are the uh, settings for the uh, second antenna that's at right angles or orthogonal to the first. Now they don't have to be oriented north or south or anything. They can be oriented really basically in any direction. Uh, direction is not important. It doesn't have to be calibrated. And it'll do a good job of picking up 360 degrees worth of uh, lightning as long as the two antennas, uh, the two ferret antennas, are kept at right angles. All right. Uh, Hitting uh, the display button again, we go to the signals page. This shows the uh, the uh, number of signals per second, uh, the numbers of signals received uh, on an average over 60 seconds. Uh, we're getting quite a bit of noise right now for the gain level, so it's kind of free running right now. And whenever a signal is received, it does show the timestamp here. Now we are in what's called interference mode because I'm operating down in kind of a noisy environment and I haven't cut the gains back. So that needs to be optimized. But um, normally we would see um, individual lightning strikes uh, flashing the yellow light here and also the timestamp of the individual lightning strike would show on that on that signals display. And the um, additional information signal uh, STR is the AS3935 local lightning detector. Shows the number of strokes and lightning cluster events that have been um, been detected. So that's indicated if that board is attached as an option. That extra thing shows here. And then of course the current UTC time is shown in the top right corner, just for a, a time reference. So that is basically it on the. On the controller board, we'll try to get some shots of this actually detecting lightning in a little better location after after we're finished. All right, this is the amplifier board that um, connects here to the north-south and uh, I'll call them north-south and east-west antennas. There's a ground connection and a shield connection uh, for each of the two inputs for the two antennas and also a, a second connection for the, the, the signal path. So a uh, signal and ground for each one of the two channels. Those connect to the screw terminals here, and I've got those connected into our antenna assembly that we'll take a look at in a moment. The um, device is controlled by this small microcontroller chip that's here. It's actually a computer. And the amplifier can run in two different modes. The first mode is manual mode, which we do not use for blitzer tune. But if you desire it for special applications, you can disconnect this uh, cable that runs back to the controller um, that uses a shielded um, Ethernet type cable. You could disconnect that, hook up your amplifier, and uh, when this is not connected, you can use the small pot to adjust the gains of the, of the uh, amplifiers. And these four LEDs will indicate in binary the current gain settings, and there's a cheat sheet that shows the actual voltage gain that's associated with each one of those binary levels. So normally that's not used and when the amplifier is under control of the controller this green light will come on indicating um, the manual mode is inactive and that uh, the amplifier is under control of the uh, the controller, main controller board. The red light just indicates there's power that's fed to the system coming over the um, this Ethernet cable, shielded Ethernet cable. Now there is a power connector, a micro USB connector is here. Power should not be applied to that connector. You should always, when using it as a blitzer tune receiver, power the unit through the Ethernet cable. So this should not be used except for initial testing 
or um, if you're doing some kind of special application, which almost, almost nobody is in reality. If you look down here, going from right to left from the signals coming in here, you can see that there's two paths. You can see the little surface mount um, ICs that I had to solder in here, uh, probably the hardest part of the entire kit. But each one of these signal paths or channels or antennas has four separate op amps that are providing gain. And each one of these, as you go from right to left, successively amplifies more and more the signal until it's to a level that can be detected and analyzed by the by the controller and the A to C uh, and the uh, analog to digital converters. Uh, similar, we have the identical set of chips here, and these resistors set the basic gain and filter characteristics of each chip. And um, some of the chips, some of the gain stages, are fixed, and some are under control through software and through the web interface provided by the. Um, Blitzer Tune controller, uh, so you can actually set those manually or automatically to adjust to various signal conditions. So that's the, uh, the so-called H-field or magnetic field antenna, meaning that it's designed to uh, amplify signals that are detected from a magnetic loop antenna that we'll take a look at next. And finally, we'll take a look here at the antenna assembly. Uh, now you can't quite see the whole thing, but it's, it's uh, constructed using this electrical junction box. And the idea of this is just to keep the two antenna rods or two antenna assemblies at right angles to one another, which is what they need to be for optimum detection. Um, so inside of each of these, let me grab one. Inside each of those aluminum colored tubes are one of these antenna assemblies that are built up of small ferrite slugs that have the effect of amplifying and concentrating the lightning signals. And this entire rod is made up of a number of these ferrite sections that are glued together and uh, slipped into this shrink tubing and then wound with a very close wound uh, set of hundreds of uh, windings of rather fine 26 gauge copper wire. Uh, the wire comes out the back end and inside the junction box is connected to these um, shielded cables where they go into the amplifier box. Um, so these are very sensitive to the magnetic component of the RF field that's generated whenever a lightning, um, lightning strikes the earth from a cloud to ground strike. It generates a very intense electromagnetic uh, frequency that's concentrated at the, around the 10 kilohertz, 10 to 100 kilohertz range. Now these are not tuned antennas like you would find in a ham radio application. Rather, they're designed to be untuned, meaning um, you do not want any stray capacitance making them especially resonant on a certain frequency. You want a very broad frequency response. And the reason for that is you do not want the details of the signal, the little peaks and valleys, to be obscured. And that would happen if you had a very tightly tuned tank type of um, antenna. So these are designed not to do that. And in fact, the system uh, prohibits adding any sort of capacitance onto these to try to tune them. It'll give you a really good sensitivity, but it'll make the system fundamentally useless for the purposes of lightning detection. Now, in each one of these uh, uh, each one of the antennas in, is encased in this PVC tubing, and I've taken that and I've covered it with um, aluminum tape that is grounded. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a very, very narrow, narrow gap that, uh, or slit that runs the length of the shielding. If that were not there, it would shield not only local noise sources, but it would shield the desired lighting signals. So putting that gap in there for number of reasons I won't get into, um, helps shield local sources of electrostatic noise picked up from, say, house wiring, but still allows the desired lightning signal to get in without any, any interference or any, in, any um, attenuation. Now when this thing ships, because this is a little bit bulky, what I do typically is I remove and these are just press fit in. I've got some, I've got a little bit of silicone grease on them. I tend to pull those out and I will tape that parallel with the other tube. So 
it needs to be untaped the wire needs to be gently passed through and this just needs to be very gently twisted back into place and the friction is adequate to hold that unless there's a very mechanically demanding application in which case you could put a set screw a short set screw in here being careful not to uh, not to penetrate the wire so that's the antenna assembly these are very sensitive these routinely will pick up lightning thousands and thousands uh, thousands of miles away and I've, it's just absolutely amazing how well it operates in fact even in the basement at these frequencies these antennas will uh, effectively pick up lightning impulses three to four thousand miles away uh, on certain depending on the conditions so that is the um, that is the basic system and uh, hopefully that is helpful and points out some of the uh, some of the features and some of the components that uh, go into making this up. Uh, the whole system should be pretty much plug and play when it's received. So all you got to do is connect it to the network, attach the power, uh, attach your ground, put your GPS antenna in a place where it has good visibility to the sky, and typically it'll work indoors with no trouble. It's working in the basement here just fine. And um, once you get it registered on the Blitzer Tune website, everything is pretty much good to go. And finally, as promised, we have a quick view of the station operating normally, picking up lightning. We've got the transparent cover on, so it is obscuring the um, view slightly. But you can see the blue lights flashing once per second, so we do have a good GPS lock. And you can see the yellow LED flashes along with the clicks indicating uh, discrete lightning events being captured. And uh, we're operating up on the second floor now with a good ground and performance actually quite good. There is a very low lightning level in North America right now which kind of accounts for the low the uh, low signal rate. Now looking at the display you can see we're on the signal display. Every time there's a click, you'll see that very accurate um, timestamp displayed. And that is the timestamp that indicates the time of arrival of the lightning signal at this station, and it is compared with other stations. And uh, with some very clever math, the actual location calculated from the time of arrival of multiple stations can be determined and plotted. So that's that's how the magic works. So as you can see fairly low signals per second and uh, per 60 second rate at the moment but I tell you during a real strong thunderstorm activity this thing can just be clicking so it almost sounds like a continual tone uh, when it's when it's tuned correctly. Just going over to the GPS screen, we can see we are locked now. We were getting 10 out of 10 available satellites. PDOP is our dilution of precision figure that basically shows how accurate the uh, positions being reported. A couple of other kind of arcane um, fields there, but basically shows our calculated accuracy of our one pulse per second. That means on the I think rising or maybe it's falling it depends how it's configured but I think on the falling edge of the pulse per second um, signal that is the accuracy of of that compared to the atomic clock in Denver Colorado which is the ultimate um, time reference for at least US time um, and some of most international uh, time bases as well so there you go. That's kind of the that's kind of the whole thing operating normally, and uh, just to again show the amplifier some distance away over here. Obviously running on remote control and uh, getting power from from the um, from the controller through the shielded Ethernet cable. You could hear a fair amount of noise coming, I think, from the camera interfering with the uh, antenna when I got it close, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, there you go. That's, uh, that's
That's the system in operation.